Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I, I want to give you um, uh, first an announcement. There is um, class and office hours. Uh, we'll meet. Well, so class next Tuesday and then Tuesday, Thursday uh, in December. So we have three more classes left after today. Office hours will meet basically until no one is around to come anymore. So through, um, through uh, the end of reading period and including the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So next Wednesday, et cetera, uh, through reading period. Feel free to come by to talk about um, any topic. Um, I should say this is my office hours. And um, the, a little warning. So next Tuesday, there will be a power outage in the Science Center. And it's supposed to be over. Um, by, uh, by noon when our class starts. And uh, so hopefully this will be no problem. Um, but if, if there's some glitch, uh, check your email. Um, check email <laughs> if uh, the Zoom um, doesn't work or if the classroom is, is somehow not open. Um, I can always teach from home or from my, uh, another location or whatever, uh, if the power is not up by, two, up by noon, but it should be up by noon. Um, okay, so let me just step back for a second and say what our target is for the next few classes. So what, we were, what we're interested in doing is, um, is several things. I want to discuss Immutability, um, eigenvalues of the Laplacian, uh, property T, and expanding graphs. And let me just say a word about how these all relate to, um, to ergodic theory. We'll see some quite concrete relations as we go on, but overall, the idea is that um, to say that a group action is ergodic, uh, this is acting on X, uh, means that if we take the representation of G, acting on L2 of X, then it has uh, no invariant vectors. And so we can think of a sort of a strong version of ergodicity as meaning that there's no almost invariant vectors. No almost invariant vectors. the action of G. What that would mean is just that there's no element of L2 that uh, is, is almost fixed. It's moved only a small amount by say generators of G, if G is a finite invariant group. And uh, it's this that notion of strong ergodicity that's going to be related to something like having a, um, a lower bound on the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian uh, of some sort of uh, a space on which uh, G acts, not necessarily the same space here. Um, and, and, it's, and it's also going to turn into something called Kajdan's property T. And then finally, it's also going to turn into something about expansion and graphs. 
And on the other hand, amenability will turn out to be the failure of strong ergodicity. So strong ergodicity will also, another version of it will be non-amenability of our group. So um, that's how these considerations, which will become increasingly concrete, are related to this more abstract uh, notion of, uh, of ergodicity. I should have said this was L2 zero of X, of course, the constant functions are invariant on a probability space. So that's how what we're doing right now fits in to the, um, to the big picture. And it's, uh, I think it's a really remarkable development that all of this geometry and combinatorial group theory and properties of finite graphs uh, is, are ultimately related to this uh, investigation of ergodicity, especially from the point of view of unitary representations. Okay. So let's return to the topic of amenability. And today I'm going to discuss some other ways of thinking about amenability of a group. So G will be a discrete group. And, um, and our first definition of amenability is that there exists a G invariant mean, uh, M from L infinity of G to the real numbers. So just a little notation, um, I'm gonna write M of G for the space of invariant means. So this is the set of all M technically in the dual of L infinity of R, uh, such that M of F is greater than or equal to zero, if F is greater than or equal to zero, and, uh, and uh, M of one is one. The constant function is V one. And then the invariant means are, are I'll write this as MG of G. These are the means which are fixed under the action of G on the space of means or on the space of finitely additive measures on, uh, sorry, this should have been L infinity of G. Um, so this, this means the mean of F of XG, we take our function and we translate it by G should be the same as the mean of uh, F of X, our original function uh, uh, for all F and L infinity and for all G in our group, the shift invariant means. Um, and then amenability is just the statement that this space is not empty. Um, okay, so what we're gonna show today is that there are two other ways of thinking about um, amenability. And the second one is uh, is very uh, geometric, and it's it's uh, it, it's most nicely formulated when G is a finitely generated group. So if G is generated by a set S, which is finite, if it's finitely generated, then uh, it, G is amenable if and only if. H1, sorry, H0 of the Cayley graph of, of G with respect to this generating set S is greater than zero. Now, what is H0? Well, this is an invariant you can define for any graph. Uh, if you have a finite set of vertices in a graph, then you can look at the vertices that are attached to them by edges, but don't belong to the set you started with. I call that the boundary of E. And then for any graph, H naught of that graph is the best isoparametric constant for the graph. That is, it's the M over V contained in G finite and, and on zero of the size of the boundary of the set divided by the size of the set. 
So no, so um, sorry, amenability corresponds to this being equal to zero. And then finally, we'll prove a third version of non-amenability, which will say that when you have the regular representation of the group, that is when the group acts on L2 of the group itself, uh, then amenability means this representation has invariant vectors. So it's only ergodic in a sort of weak sense. And so non-amenability will be a kind of strong ergodicity. So I'll wait, I'll wait to formulate that, um, that definition until after we've done uh, this proof. Um, okay, so let me first explain why this second condition is um, is so nice. So let's let's um, remember how we proved that. Um, let's recall that G equals Z is amenable, and uh, this is we can take here for our generating set the elements plus or minus one. It's nice to have the generating set closed under inverse. Um, and then the Cayley graph of G, depending how you like to draw it, it's, it's just the integers with an edge connecting adjacent integers because those differ by translation by an element of S. So that's our, our graph. And then the isoparametric constant for this graph Zero, because we can take, for example, the part of the graph that consists of the integers from zero up to n, and the size of the, the boundary of gn is uh, just two, even though the size of, size of gn is n plus one. So this over the cardinality of gn is two over n plus one, which goes to zero. So that's something very easy to test about a group if you understand it well enough. Figure out if you can find the subsets with small boundary. And a sequence like this is called a Fulner sequence for G. And the essential thing about this Fulner sequence is that these GNs are finite. They're finite subsets of your group. And so there's no problem averaging over those sets. And then the statement that the boundary is small compared to the size of the set says that the mean over GN is almost invariant under, uh, under the group action. And so in the limit, uh, and then by compactness of the space M of G, uh, we get um, the existence of an invariant mean for G. And that works for, for, any, uh, for any group. Um, and that, so that shows, in fact, that two implies one. So two implies one. And let me make this a little bit more precise. So M of G is compact. But what topology is it compact in? It's compact in the weak star topology. Technically, M of G is a subset of the dual of L infinity of G. And as such, it comes equipped with a topology where we say M alpha tends to M if and only if M alpha of F tends to M of F for all F in L infinity. So if the means converge pointwise. And uh, there's an awful lot of functions in L infinity of G to test, uh, which is why we generally have to use nets. And then compactness is really a sort of, it's a, it's a powerful property that in this, this setting can, can only be proved using the axiom of choice. Nevertheless, once we get, once we have compactness, we can then take the obvious means averaging over GN, these become more and more invariant. And so, uh, so the proof that two implies one is we just let MN be um, of F 
equal to the average over gn of f of x. And these become more and more nearly invariant. So mn of g dot f minus f is, um, is less than or equal to the size of the boundary of gn divided by the size of gn times the L infinity norm of f if g is in this generating set s. And uh, so that tends to zero as n goes to infinity. So any accumulation point of these mn's will be invariant under s. So let m be any accumulation point using compactness of m of g, uh, then g dot m equals m for all g and s. And since s generates the group, this implies that, uh, that m is fixed by g. So it's in m of g, g. Um, okay, so, so that's pretty easy to go from Fellner sequences to, um, to invariant means. And a lot of people, when they think about amenability, they just forget about this invariant mean stuff. But it turns out that when you're, when you're really working with it, um, it's often much easier to do proofs using invariant means. For example, to prove that when you have an exact sequence, um, you, the, the middle term in the sequence is amenable if the beginning and end terms are, um, that's a very easy to prove using invariant means. It's a lot harder to prove using Fulner sequences, or at least it's a bit more awkward to prove. Um, also, the invariant mean makes no reference to a generating set. So it's, it's more canonical than, uh, than the, this uh, definition. And uh, this isoparametric constant, though, I should mention, um, it, it depends on the generating set, but not very much. So if, if you change to a different generating set, it turns out that the graph you started with and the graph you end up with are, they have comparable metrics on them. And so this, uh, const, this uh, H naught changes by only a bounded factor. And, um, and, uh, and in fact, the two graphs are by Lipschitz. Um, the reason is that if you have one generating set, then every generator in a second generating set can be ge written as a word of bounded length in the first. And that gives a Lipschitz bound going one way and similarly going the other way. Okay, so the, the harder direction, the more interesting direction is to start with just an invariant mean, which is a fairly abstract object, and go to this sequence of polar sets. So I want to describe the proof of that um, to give you an idea of, of some of the um, some of the richness of the functional analysis that underpins the theory of amenability. So we'll we've used some definitions from functional analysis. And even some theorems, we use compactness of the unit ball in the weak start topology, which is L.A. Oglu's theorem. And um, for the proof of this second implication, uh, you know, there's another theorem in functional analysis I'm going to recall. So, so here's a picture that I want you to keep in mind uh, when a, a sort of an overall description of the study of invariant means on any set, but in particular on a group. So you have L1 of the group, and then you have its dual space, L infinity of the group. So that gives its dual. And then the dual of this is L, it's, it's this complicated thing called L infinity of G star. It corresponds to, as I've mentioned many times, the finitely additive measures on G. And then sitting inside of here is the space of means. And this is a uh, weak star. Now, there is always a map from 
the L1 functions on G into the L infinity functions on G. Because there's a pairing between L1 functions and L infinity functions. So you can just, uh, you can just use that pairing to describe an element here as a point in the dual. The fact that this is not an isomorphism is what makes this study complicated. Uh, it means this space is not reflexive. Uh, nevertheless, over here, we have a nice space, which I'm going to call PC of G. And this will be the set of things that look like means, but they just come from functions with finite support. So it's the set of F from G to R such that um, f of x is positive everywhere. Uh, the sum of f of g is equal to 1. And um, of course, uh, that means it's L1 norm is 1. And, uh, and um, also, uh, no, I guess that's it. And if I have an element here, it defines a mean. Uh, actually, let me call these W for weights. So this is a way of attaching weights to elements of the group. Oh, I also want to say that uh, uh, the support of W is finite. This is just for convenience. So in other words, W is just a finite sum of um, if you like, if you want to think of it as a measure, it's a finite sum of ai times delta functions at gi, i goes from 1 to n, where the sum of the ai's is equal to 1. So those are special examples of, of measures, and they give rise to means in the obvious way. Um, so the mean of w applied to f is just the sum of w of g f of g the whole group. And this is a finite sum. So these, these very simple means lie in L1 and they sit inside the space uh, over here of, uh, of all means. Now what's special about PC of G that we're going to use as we go forward is that PC of G is convex. That's obvious. These conditions are closed under forming convex uh, combinations of elements here. And now there's a little lemma from functional analysis that I want to remind you of, which is going to be one of the keystones in the proof. Um, the lemma is that um, if E contained in X, a Bonnach space, is convex, then the weak closure of E is equal to the norm closure of E. So first, let me remind you what these things mean. So the weak closure of a set means that you consider E alpha as tending to, um, to, to X in X, if and only if phi of E alpha tends to phi of uh, X for all phi in the dual. And in general, weak convergence is, uh, is much weaker <laughs> than norm convergence. So, so for example, if uh, just to remind you how this works, for example, in L2 of 0, 1, you can take functions which are uh, supported um, on the interval from 0 to 1 over n and they all have norm one. And these functions, uh, these fn, converge to um, zero weakly, even though the norm of the fn's are equal to one for all n. 
And that's a typical phenomenon. It, mass of functions can be lost in the limit under weak, under weak convergence. Uh, so you get compactness, for example, of the unit ball in L2 in the weak topology, but then you give up, for example, the fact that the norm is continuous. Now, the beautiful thing about convex sets is that the, the, um, their weak closures are equal to their norm closures. So if you show something is in the weak closure of a convex set, you get to automatically see that it's in the norm closure. And the reason for this is um, you, if you think about what weak convergence means, uh, what it says, for example, is that if we have E, our convex set, and um, we want to show a point is not in its closure, then we should find a function phi which separates that point from E. And that's, that's equivalent to finding a hyperplane in your Bonnach space, a closed hyperplane with E on one side and this point on the other and a definite separation. Uh, between them. And, um, but you see by the hahn bonnach theorem, if you have any point that's not in the norm closure of E, you can separate it from this convex set by a linear functional. But differently, the norm closure is the intersection, of, the weak star closure is the intersection of all the half spaces containing E. And when you have a convex set, the intersection of those half spaces is just the ordinary closure of the set. Okay, so now let's proceed to go from a mean, which is very abstract, to a um, to a uh, a Fulmer se sequence. So we're going to prove that if uh, if G has an invariant mean, then this implies that H1, H0 of G, of the Cayley graph of G, with respect to this generating set S, is equal to, C, it is equal to zero. Okay, so we have to somehow go from this abstract mean to specific finite subsets of the group that witness the failure of the isoparametric inequality. Um, or they, they exhibit the fact that zero is the best constant in the isoparametric inequality. Um, okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, the idea is that these compactly supported weights are much more concrete and easier to deal with than, um, than the abstract means on, uh, sorry, this should be the means on G, than, than the general means on G. Um, but in fact, these guys are dense in these guys, uh, but only in the weak star topology. But that's enough. So um, what we're going to do is approximate our mean by finitely supported weights and then use that to create our Fulner sequence. Um, so the proof is, the first step in the proof is to observe that PC of G bar in the weak star topology is equal to the space of all means on G. Certainly it's contained in the space of means because these conditions are compatible with the conditions that define the space of means, but why is every mean approximated by just one of these finite sums? Well, you have to remember what it, what it means <laughs> for um, an element here to be a limit of a net here. So M alpha tends to M if and only if M alpha of F tends to M of F for all, um, for all uh, F in L infinity. And what we need to do to, def so what's an open neighborhood of, of, uh, of M? It's a collection of means that give almost the same value as M does on some finite list of functions. So um, a neighborhood U of M 
is the set of means m prime such that the absolute value of m of f minus m prime of f sub i is less than epsilon for some finite list of L infinity functions fi. Now, usually, this when we think about L infinity, nothing we were, want to converge in L infinity converges because the L infinity norm is so strong. But there is one kind of function that is dense in L infinity. And those are the so-called simple functions, the functions which take only finitely many values. And the reason is that if you have a function on L infinity, it's bounded. So its graph maybe goes between minus one and one. And so now if you cut the graph horizontally, then you find some sets on which the function varies only a small amount. And then you can replace the function by a constant here and a constant here and a constant here. And you move the, the graph of the function by only a bounded amount. So simple functions are dense in L infinity. And so when we talk about this neighborhood, we can assume that the fi are simple. That is, they assume only finitely many values. And since there's only finitely many fi, we can, uh, we can assume or we can find a partition Uh, G into the disjoint union of such GI finite in number. These are will almost always all be infinite sets. So this is not yet anything like our Fellner sequence. We can find a partition such that FI restricted to GI is a constant. Okay, so now all we have to do is find a mean with finite support that gives the same average when, it, when evaluated on functions of this type. Now that's the same thing as finding a measure on G that assumes the same values on these finally many sets as the measure associated to M does. And I'll denote that measure by F. So I'll define M of a set B to be the mean applied to the indicator function of B. That's the associated finitely additive measure. And this is very easy. You see, you've taken your space, you've cut it up into a bunch of pieces, and now all you have to do is pick a point, xi, inside of gi. And m is some complicated measure on gi, but you just take all of its mass and compress it to that one point. So you choose points xi in each gi, and then you define uh, uh, M, and this will depend on this set. Um, so let me call it M alpha, where alpha is this data of this list of functions, uh, Fi and the epsilon. So M alpha is just equal to the sum of M of GI times a delta function at a point Xi in GI. Uh, and again, this is just a finite sum. And so here we have a finite sum of delta masses. That's the same as a weight. So this, if you like, is W sub alpha. And W of alpha lies in the open set U by construction. So we've shown that for any open set U, there's a, you know, maybe I should just have called this U u is defined by this data. So we define m of u in this way. Actually, we can sure call this w of u because it's a weight. <laughs> and then w of u is in u. OK, so for every open set, we were able to find a weight inside of it. And so these are dense. OK, that part's pretty straightforward, elementary. Um, now comes the use of functional analysis. So when we're looking at, at a, a weight, and we're hoping it's going to be invariant under um, 
the action of G, we can look up the generators and see how close it is to being invariant. So let's um, define the variation with respect to S of a weight W to be the sum over elements in our finite generating set of the norm of G dot W minus W in L1. So let me remind you these weights. I'm going to change my notation and just call them W G for weights. These weights are in L1. So the L1 norm applies to them. This is just uh, seeing what the difference of their values are and then summing that up over all the points in their support. Um, so the claim two is that there exist uh, weights Wn with the variation over S of Wn tending to zero. Okay, now, how do we prove that? Let's first start with a G with just one G in S. So let's just try to find a weight who's, that has a small norm variation when you apply this one generator to it. Um, so let's go back to see what we know about these uh, weights here. So we know that there exists a, a, a net of weights, W alpha, tending to our invariant mean M. And we know that G dot M minus M is equal to zero. So you might say, oh, that shows the variation of M is zero, so the variation of these W alphas must be zero. But this W alpha is tending to M in the uh, weak star topology. So the statement that G dot M minus M is equal to zero, that says that G dot W alpha minus W alpha, this does indeed tend to zero, but it tends to zero in the weak topology on L1. Because the weak star topology on the dual of L infinity is this induces the weak topology on L1. The weak topology comes from the dual of L1. And you'll remember that um, for convex sets, the, um, the norm closure and the weak closure coincide. So what we'd really like to do is so, show that we can find W such, such that this tends to zero in the strong topology. And now we use the following beautiful fact. The space of weights is convex. And so what this says is that if we take G minus the identity, which is a linear operator, and we apply it to the weights on G, and then we take its closure in the weak topology, that this contains zero. But this set is convex, and this is a linear map. So the closure in the weak topology is the same as the closure in the strong topology. And the closure in the strong topology means that we can find a sequence of weights such that G minus the identity applied to those weights converges to zero. And that's that, so, so this implies there exists Wn in W on G such that the L1 norm of G minus Wn minus Wn tends to zero. So at least we've gotten one element in our generating set to, to work. Um, how do you do it for all the elements in the generating set? Well, instead of considering this map G minus I applied to the weights for one element in your generating set, you consider these differences for all elements. So you take, so to speak, the product of the operators G minus I, and this gives you a map from the weights on G 
into the product over the generating set of finitely many copies of L1 of G. And then you apply the same reasoning here and you'll get the conclusion for all of the finitely many generators rather than just one of them. So that's a, that's a simple boosting up of the argument just presented. Okay, so that's, that took a little functional analysis. Um, and the last step is some very nice and uh, simple combinatorics. But notice we've already made a lot of progress because what we've done is we've taken this very abstract mean and we've replaced it by some means that we understand. Um, unfortunately, these means are not quite invariant, but their variation tends to zero. So now everything has become concrete. So the last step is combinatorics. It's to take this concrete statement and turn it into a statement about G itself, rather than a statement about functions on G. Okay, so for three, what we do is the following. Um, uh, so we choose a weight W with um, uh, the variation over S of W of less than epsilon. And now what we do is we write W as, again, a finite sum of constants AI times the indicator function of GI over the cardinality of GI, where G1 contained in G2, et cetera, are all finite sets. And uh, the sum of the AIs is equal to Now, why is this possible? This again uses one of the main motifs in the study of, uh, of, of functions. This sort of underlies the Vega integration and everything else. The idea is to slice the graph of the function horizontally. So remember, W is a function with finite support. So say GN is the support of W. And it's a finite. Now we can write, we can arrange the points of GN so that um, the function W is increasing as you move along these points. So you can picture the graph of W as going like this. Of course, it's really a step function. And so W itself takes on only finitely many values. And now you cut the graph of W horizontally at each of the finitely many values it assumes. So here, let's call this value AN, or rather let's call the height of this slice AN, and then the height of this slice AN minus one and so on. And then the base of this rectangle we'll call GN minus one, it's a subset of GN. And then the base of this rectangle, GN minus two, all the way up to G1, whose side will be A1. Um, okay, so now we've written, uh, oh, and, and let's see, I'm not sure, sorry, I should call these B1, BN, BN minus one, et cetera. So we've now written F as a sum of indicator functions times certain constants, and then if we just renormalize the constants by the size of these sets, we get a, an expression for W as a linear combination of the normalized indicator functions of these GIs. So notice that these guys themselves are weights. And we've just expressed F as a finite sum of these very basic weights that come from subsets, finite subsets of G. Okay, and now here comes, here comes the combinatorial part. Let's look at what we can say about the variation. Uh, 
Uh, so GW, we look at GW minus W evaluated at a given point X. And so that will be the sum of AI over the size of GI times the indicator function of GI of X minus the indicator function of GI of, um, of uh, XG. Okay, now let's consider what this function measures. What this function tells us is whether or not G pushes X into GI or pushes it out of GI. So if X is in GI, but XG is not in GI, then this is equal to one. If the reverse happens, if X is not in GI, but it gets pushed into GI, it's equal to minus one and otherwise it's zero if the status of X is unchanged. But you see, if X gets pushed out of GI, then it also gets pushed out of anything smaller than GI that still contains it. Until you finally get up to a GI that doesn't contain X at all, and then it can't be pushed out or pushed in, and so this becomes zero. So what we can see is that because of nesting, all of these terms in the sum of the difference have the same sign. So these terms, all have the same sign as I varies. That's because of nesting of the GIs. And what that means is that the L1 norm of GW minus W is just the sum of the L1 norms of these functions. And what's the L1 norm of this function? Well, the indicator function of GI XG is just um, the symmetric difference between its, its L1 norm is the symmetric difference between this set and the translate of GI by G. So what we get in the end is a sum over S of AI times the symmetric difference between GI and little GGI divided by the cardinality of GI. And we've summed over S. But you see, if we think of, of G as a bunch of vertices in a graph, GGI consists of the vertices that are joined to elements of GI by an edge. And the symmetric difference is the points that are joined by an edge but don't reside in the set to start out with. So in fact, if we move the sum of S inside, we get that this is the sum over S of the variation over S of, um, of, of the weight of, well, sorry, let me say it's the sum over AI of the size of the boundary of GI divided by the size of GI. And remember that we've started with a weight with the property that its variation is less than epsilon. So, um, so we, sorry, there should have been a sum over S here. So the variation over S of W is this sum. And the variation is epsilon. And we've written it as a convex combination of isoparametric ratios. Well, if you write epsilon as a convex combination of numbers, at least one of those numbers has to be less than epsilon. Otherwise, the convex combination will come out to be too big. So since the sum of AI is equal to one, the size of the boundary of GI over GI itself is less than or equal to epsilon for some i. And so we found in this way a finite subset of the group whose boundary is small compared to the size of the set. And since epsilon was arbitrary, this shows that the isoparametric inequality for the group, group graph is zero. Okay. So this is, I wanted to do one semi-substantial proof in the theory of amenability, and this is a, this is a good example.
Okay, so amenability is uh, is equivalent to this um, vanishing of the isoparametric constant, but more to the point, non-amenability is has an interesting conclusion for the shape of the graph. So let's phrase, now that we've completed the proof, let's phrase it in a slightly different way. Phrase what the upshot is. So the corollary is that um, is that if uh, well G is non-amenable if and only if there exists a constant lambda greater than zero such that for every finite set. A contained in G, the size of the boundary of A is greater than or equal to lambda times the size of A with respect to the Cayley graph. So implicit in here is a, uh, is a generating set S. Okay, so the Cayley graphs of non-amenable groups have this nice property that any set has a large boundary. So the prime example of a non-amenable group is the free group, as we've discussed. And uh, it's, we showed that the balls in the free group have exponential growth. Uh, in fact, one can show that the isoparametric inequality, that is the worst ratio here, comes by taking the boundary of a ball in the free group. So the free group, you can compute this concretely. I think it comes out to be about three for the graph, this trifurcating graph that we've, uh, that we've discussed. Um, Anyway, this can be easily, we can give a concrete bound here. Maybe I'll do that. So let's see the size of the ball of radius n, we computed this before, is one plus four plus four times three plus, plus four times three to the, I guess this must be n minus well, this was the ball of radius zero. So this is one, two, so three to the n minus one. So it's one plus uh, four times one plus three up to three to the n minus one. Now somebody has to help me solve the geometric, solve the geometric series. So this is one over four times um, three to the n minus one over three minus one, if I'm not mistaken. So in any case, this is asymptotic to three to the n. And, uh, and the size, uh, so the size triples every time you, uh, you go to the next layer. And so the boundary of Bn has cardinality approximately uh, three to the n plus one minus three to the n. And the cardinality of Bn that's cardinality approximately three to the n. And so we cancel out and we get that this is asymptotic to two, three minus one. So I think that a slightly more refined analysis will show that each of the Cayley graph here is equal to two. Okay, so we have this concrete expansion. Now, what we're ultimately going to be going for in, uh, in the theory of expanding graphs is finite models of this expansion. Um, but before we do that, let me make a point about a consequence of this non-amenability. So a corollary is that if G is non-amenable, then this implies G has 
exponential growth. In other words, if we form the Cayley graph of G with respect to some finite generating set, this induces a metric on G, then the number of elements in the ball around the identity of radius n is greater than or equal to a constant times some lambda to the n, where lambda is greater than one. And the reason is simple. It's, it's basically the same phenomena we saw here. So we start with, when we have the ball of radius n, the size of its boundary is at least the size of the set itself. So the size of bn plus one, sorry, lambda is, uh, yeah, lambda is greater than one. So the size of, sorry, this should be, we can make, make this a different lambda, capital lambda. So the size of bn plus one is greater than or equal to uh, one plus lambda, this lambda here, times the size of bn. The first term accounting for bn, the small lambda here accounting for the new elements, the boundary of bn, which describes bn plus one. And so we get exponential growth with one plus little lambda as our growth point. Um, so definitely, Non-amenable groups have exponential growth, although the converse is not true. Now, um, uh, let's back up and think about the finite world. So an expanding graph will be a graph which looks like the graph of a non-amenable group, but it's finite. Okay, so what property should that graph have? Well, you'd like it to have this property that that's, every set has small boundary, but of course you could take the whole graph, that would be a finite set, and then there would be no boundary. So we define um, uh, the ex an expanding graph in a somewhat ad hoc way by saying not that um, H zero of the graph is, uh, is, uh, is large, is bigger than zero, but that H one of the graph is bigger than zero. So we let H one of, of uh, curly G for G a finite graph, the number of vertices finite, um, I call this H1 of G to distinguish it from H0 of G, which would just be zero. This is the if over subsets of the vertices of G with the size of A less than or equal to half the number of all the vertices of, and then again, the size of the boundary of A over the size of A. Now, of course, this number is greater than zero provided the graph is connected. Because if the graph is connected, any subset that's not the whole graph has to have a non-trivial boundary. So this is greater than zero if G is connected. And of course, the Cayley graph of any group will be connected. So, um, so that's, uh, that's not such a big deal. Um, but um, uh, so, so to say you have an expander, it's not a, a interesting to just say, oh, I found a graph where this constant is positive because this constant is always positive. What you want to find is a sequence of larger and larger graphs where this constant does not tend to zero. So definition, GI is a sequence of expanding graphs, or one often just says that the GIs are expanders, if there exists, well, oh, let me just write it this way, if um, the cardinality of GI, by which I mean the number of vertices, goes to infinity, um, and the if 
of H1 of GI is, um, is uh, greater than or equal to, uh, uh, is, is positive. So this inequality holds with a uniform constant throughout all of these graphs. Now, you, you could make some graphs that become more and more expanding in a very simple way. You, you take, um, for example, you could take the complete graph, a graph where there's an edge joining any two elements. Then the boundary of even one point is the whole graph. <laughs> and so you've got a huge constant here, uh, two, <laughs> for all those graphs. So that's not very interesting. What's interesting is to do this where the number of edges coming out of a given vertex is, um, is, is bounded. So to make this interesting, we usually ask that the degree of GI, which is the maximum number of edges incident to some vertex V or G uh, is uh, O1. In other words, it's bounded independent of I. And the most interesting case, the simplest case, is trivalent graphs, because graphs with degree two can't possibly be expanders. The only thing they can look at, like, is a circle or an interval, provided they're connected. Okay. Now, what's good about having expanders? The first thing is that expanders look like trees. They have the same expansion properties that trees do, except for the fact that, um, except for the fact that you have to stop when you get to a set that's as big as the graph. So, um, so properties. Of expanders. So, of course, the first property is, is just restating it here. There exists a constant lambda such that the cardinality of the boundary of A is greater than or equal to lambda times the cardinality of A for all A contained in some GI, provided A is a cardinality less than half GI. That implies that the, the ball around any point of radius r in the graph is greater than or equal to a constant times 1 plus lambda, as we did before, to the radius r. r should be an integer here, uh, provided um, the ball is not too big. So the volume of the ball is itself less than half the cardinality of the graph. And now here's a neat fact. If you have an expanding graph, then the diameter of the whole graph is big O of the logarithm of the number of vertices in the graph. And in fact, if you have a graph of bounded degree, its diameter has to can can the the smallest its diameter can be is the logarithm of the of the number of vertices to the base of the degree of the graph because that's the the, the fastest the balls of radius r can grow so so in fact the diameter is comparable with constants bounded above and below in terms of the degree and the expansion constant to the logarithm of g but the interesting thing is the upper bound you have graphs with small degree where um, uh, that are, have a lot of elements, um, but um, small diameter. And one way of saying this is that GI is a small world. Okay, so here's, <laughs> uh, here's a little test of popular culture. How many people have ever heard of the game Kevin Bacon? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so uh, I see some hands going up and then down again. 
Uh, Michael, do you want to explain to us what Kevin Bacon is? You mean like the Bacon number? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I guess maybe Erdish numbers are more popular here, but it's the same idea. I which said is... this was a test of popular <laughs> culture, not nerd culture. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like the maximum distance you need to get between actors who have worked um, in movies together. Uh, and the goal is like, how close can you get to Bacon, who's an actor? Um, right. So what's the distance? So Kevin Bacon is kind of a mid-fleet actor. He's been in a lot of movies and, uh, and it, almost all actors, prominent or not, have been, have partnered in a movie with someone else who has partnered in a movie with someone else who has, et cetera, until you reach Kevin Bacon. So, um, so, so that's, a, so the, and the fact that you can find these chains of actors with, um, with, uh, um, with pretty small length, linking any two pairs of people in this big community shows that the space of actors is itself a small world. Although you might ask, what's the degree of the vertices? Um, and maybe Kevin Bacon has huge degree because he's been in so many movies. Um, but in any case, that's the idea of a small world. The Erdős number is another idea of a small world. Most mathematicians have an Erdős number of at most four or five. And this means that you've co-authored a paper with somebody who's co-authored a paper, et cetera, with somebody who co-authored a paper with Paul Erdős. Um, you know, the, the, the spreads of a virus in a community where people have only a small number of contacts is still exponentially fast if it's a small world, right? Because yes, some people in your group have been isolating, except one of them met somebody in my group, et cetera, et cetera. So the exponential spread of, of epidemics has to do with the fact that immediate contacts give a graph on a great number of people, which forms a small world. Um, okay, so that's one, these are, some of the properties and interests in finding these expanding graphs. And uh, the last one I'll mention has to do with how, who discovered the first instruction of expanding graphs. It was discovered by Margulis when he was working in the former Soviet Union. And he was working for not a, a university, but for, um, a state institution concerned with electronics and communication. So why were people who were designing communication networks interested in these expanders? Well, let's, let's think in a more modern terminology. So you have, um, you have everybody's workstation in the world. So these are all the computers. And now when you communicate to another computer, you're actually going, let's say computers, and um, I'm not quite sure what to call them. Um, uh, uh, let's call them routers. <laughs> so computers connect to routers, which connect several computers together, which connect to other routers. Some of the routers connect to other routers and so on. And in this way, everybody on the internet is able to talk to everybody else. Okay, and now, um, and now you can ask uh, what happens if some collection of routers goes down? Some collection of, of, of routers goes down, it fails. So let me call this F. Uh, there's a bunch of failures in our network. It might be that those failures form the boundary of a region A. And then the people that are in this region A are cut off from the rest of the world. But if there was just one connection left, they would still be able to talk to everyone else, although there'd be a lot of traffic across this connection. So you want to ask if you have a bunch of failures, how many people can be disconnected from the network? Well, F, if these are the isolated people, then the failures form, I uh, include the boundary of A. 
And so the size of the failures is greater than the size of the boundary of A, but the size of the boundary of A is an upper bound for lambda times the size of A. And so some constant times the number of failures bounds the number of people that are isolated. And so that's a, that's a good property of the network is you can't cut off a, a, a number of users. Um, with, you can't cut off a large number of users with a small number of failures. If, if everyone was connected in a straight line, then obviously a failure at any point, just one failure would, might disconnect a big piece of the world. If people are standing in a line and the only people they've ever met in their life are the people before them and the people before after them, then they don't form a small world. It takes a lot of acquaintances, to, uh, mutual acquaintances, to link the, the two ends of the line. And the striking thing about this statement is that it works no matter what the set F is. See, it's relatively easy to construct graphs uh, which look like trees locally, and therefore they, they have this expansion property. They have exponential expansion at a small scale. Um, in other words, where the balls grow exponentially fast. In fact, there are uh, solvable groups who's, uh, that we've seen uh, who, that are expanding groups. Uh, that's the infinite analog. Uh, but what's important here is that this is true for all subsets A, not just for subsets that conveniently form the boundary of, of, a, of a ball, or something like that. Okay, so this is uh, one of our goals, is to construct, construct expanders. And you see, what we've done very easily is we've constructed the infinite version of expanders. The graph of a free group is on two generators is an example where H0 of G is bound to below, and now we want to bound H1 of G from below. So that's our, that's our target. Um, okay, so that was a little bit of looking ahead. Um, but interestingly enough, the construction of expanders uh, that is the most mathematically natural factors through infinite groups. And it can be presented in two different ways. One where it has to do with the, the geometry of the Laplacian, and another where it has to do with, um, with uh, the behavior of unitary representation, sort of strong ergodicity. And in fact, it was strong ergodicity that Margulis used to prove his, uh, his first construction. So that's our target, and eventually these GIs will be constructed using various groups. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to end by giving you one last characterization of, uh, of amenability that will be essential uh, going forward. It will motivate the definition of this rather poorly named property called Kajdan's property T. So one more characterization of amenability. The theorem is G is amenable if and only if L2 not of G has almost invariant vectors. So you'll, you'll recall that ergodicity uh, was the statement that when you have a group acting on a finite measure space, that, um, that L2 has an invariant vector. Uh, that's the failure of er ergodicity, that the only, the, the, the ergodicity means the only invariant vector is constant. So under, in the ergodic situation, L2 naught of G has no invariant vectors. Um, and of course, it, an invariant vector could only exist on G when G is finite, and in which case it would be constant. And L2 naught means, um, means uh, we've taken the uh, orthogonal to the constants, or we, we've excluded the constants. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I don't even need to take not here, uh, because we'll be interested in the case where G is infinite. 
So anyway, what is an almost invariant vector? So if G X are unitary transformations on the Hilbert space X, uh, we say uh, this has almost invariant vectors. And here G can be a locally compact group. So let's say if for all compact sets K contained in G and for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an F in your Hilbert space with the norm of F equal to one and such that the norm of G dot F minus F in L1 is less than epsilon for all G in this compact set. So as far as the group is concerned, there's this vector which uh, doesn't seem to be moving very much. Another way to think about this is that if we define Pn of G to be the inner product between GFn and Fn, remember this is a good way of measuring how much G is moved by Fn because if this is uh, identically equal to one, then G must fix Fn. This is a nice function on your group. Almost a very vectors means there exists Fn with the norm equal to one, such that this function tends to one uniformly on compact sets. Now, people who are doing representation theory in a more systematic uh, way would say that what this means is that this representation of G, although it might not contain the trivial representation, its closure in some suitable topology called the felt topology contains the uh, trivial representation. But we can take this as the definition. There's vectors which barely move, which means it almost looks like G contains the uh, trivial representation. Um, and uh, so as we, as I said before, the isolation of the trivial representation in terms of this action is sort of a strong form of ergodicity. So amenability means you don't have strong ergodicity for the action of G on itself. And non-amenability means you do. You can't even find uh, almost invariant vectors. Okay, so I'm slightly over time, but the proof of this is so fast uh, that I'll give it. So the proof in one direction is very easy. So if G is amenable, then we have these folder sets where the boundary of GI over GI goes to zero. And then we just let Fn be the indicator function of GI uh, times a constant to make it have L2 norm equal to one. So I think that constant is GI to the one half. Uh, in any case, we, we take these functions which are indicator functions on sets that barely move under the action of, uh, of G. Um, and uh, what's a compact subset of G, it's just finitely many elements. If we can show they barely move under the generators, then they barely move under, under this compact set because that's contained in a ball of radius n around the generators. So anyway, if, if, um, if G is amenable, you just take the indicator functions coming from a folder sequence and they give almost invariant vectors. So this implies almost invariant vectors. And conversely, if you have almost invariant vectors Fn, you define a sequence of means in the obvious way. The mean of an L infinity function H is just given by taking the inner product between Fn and H times Fn. In other words, you integrate over your group G H of X times the probability measure, the absolute value of Fn squared. Of course, this is really a sum in the case of the discrete groups that we're discussing. And because of the fact that these Fn are almost invariant, these measures 
are nearly invariant under the action of, of uh, G. And then we take a weak star limit as usual, and this gives M, which is a G invariant. Okay, so that's the final characterization of immutability. It's, uh, it comes, it can be phrased in terms of unitary representations. Okay, so next uh, we will we'll carry this through to uh, a discussion of uh, how the Laplacian relates to these isoparametric inequalities and use that to get one construction of expanders that's very explicit. And then we'll discuss prop Kajdan's property T, which is very general and also gives expanders, but without uh, explicit constants. Okay.